Okay, so uh, what do you see as your biggest challenge when starting a new project? You know, every film, Patrick, is different. Every And every department, and um, you interview so many people, every designer, department head, you know, for costumes, cinematography, we each have our own kind of cross to bear when we start a project. Sometimes it's an easy makeup movie. That happens. Not often. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's a movie where it's all about the hair. Sometimes it's all about the costumes. Sometimes it is all about the makeup. You know, I feel like that, I, I think in that world, the productions are different now that we have less time. And you probably hear this from other people. I feel like we used to know months in advance, like who's in the movie, what we're shooting. My biggest challenge, I won't lie, I'm gonna say is you get the call, they tell you who's in it or they're not 100%, and we're not quite sure. And then you find out the actor's attached to three other films and you will not speak to he or she uh, for, you know, a week before you're shooting and suddenly they want, you know, something very special that you can't do in a week. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's the biggest challenge. Doing the makeup is easy. I mean, you just, we do what we do. Um, very few departments face the challenges we do these days between visual effects, the marriage of the two, and prepping the actors, because we get the least amount of prep of mm -hmm. most of the visual departments. With that, you know, limited amount of prep, did you and Jared Leto collaborate to develop a makeup for his character, Albert Sparma? Sure. So, you know, John Lee Hancock was, was wonderful because he's a writer first, and he's a director, obviously. But I felt that being a writer-director, not director-writer, mm -hmm. I felt that he was visually really leaning on his support people to help him. Yeah. Uh, so every time I went to him, I'd show him some pictures, and he, he looked a bit startled, but also very, to, I guess, to his credit, would say, you don't, you know, what do you think? Sure. And I kind of like that because he lets he keeps in his lane and and so I went up to see Jared. He requested a meeting with me. We knew each other uh, from another project and we talked and it was wonderful because he was so happy to see me, which made me feel good because we're in a business that's very fickle and, and you know, out of sight, out of mind. And I went to his home and, and he was happy to see me. And then he showed me his wall of kind of inspiration and mood boards and it was very much along the same lines of what I was thinking, watching, you know, first 48 hours. And um, and then we talked a little bit and then we went back with the hair guys and my team. We went back around a week later to try a bunch of wigs that weren't really working. It was too out there. Those hair guys really tried because we couldn't figure it out. And I was able, I think, to say to Jared, you know, if you go too far with this, it's it's going to be preposterous. I mean, I'm willing to take that chance. And and Jared was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, really. You're going to regret this. I can promise you. And that's when we talked about the nose. And he said, I want a big, we put this small generic nose on him, just, you know, at the bridge of your nose right here. Mm -hmm. And it changed him a little bit, but he kept saying, Donald, I still look like Jared Leto. So, you know, we decided you want a schnoz, you want a monumental nose. <laughs> so that's what we did for him. Yeah. And the acne scars and the dirty, oily kind of complexion and the teeth he didn't want, but I pushed. I said, if we get these made right and fit right for you, I'll have my team, my lab, make you great teeth. You're going to love them. They're going to change the shape of your mouth. It's going to maybe shift your speech a little. Mm -hmm. And then I want to do the dark contact lenses, which he said no, because we'd had that experience on Blade Runner. And it was pretty awful on me um, because contact lenses are can be quite a nightmare, actually, mm -hmm. you know, with smoke and dust. But Jared kind of gave in to, to this one and said, whatever, you, let's try it. And we put them, the difference of that makeup test of Jared with a nose, acne, oily, greasy hair, and not having the dark brown eyes didn't work. But the minute the dark brown went in, that's it. We got Sparma. Obviously, his transformation was more extensive than others. But right. what, what, what kind of makeup choices did you make on, say, Rami Malek or Denzel Washington? Well, Denzel's got his team who are incredible. Uh, Carl Fullerton, who's a legend in the business, 
um, been with Denzel for years. Pretty straightforward, actually. I mean, those characters were really, you know, typical uh, in this sort of narrative, these guys. Rami was a little bit different because for me, he'd come off this huge success and heat of, and pressure of um, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Sure. And, you know, he thought the character should look very tight, very tightly wound, uh, groomed, very, you know, clean shaved. And I thought that made sense. And he was more put together, kind of preppy um, uh -huh. compared to the others. And I thought that was a good move, but it still took some work. And then, of course, we have Jared and and then our, our, our girls, our victims who were just actually so much fun to work with. And we really? did all those makeups, but we... We made it light. I had some great people on my team. We worked really well together. And those victims, it should have been a really, you know, could have been dark and and heavy. But instead, we played music and we just enjoyed ourselves. And and we had fun as makeup artists getting to do things we don't often do, which is like full body makeup, um, forensic crime scene recreations. It was kind of fun and, and very challenging. That's interesting. I like that contrast of listening to music while putting together these dead bodies. Yeah, yeah. The girls were great. They really were. And and I think it's a credit to my crew, like, you know, Mark Neiman and Ruth Haney and our additional people who really knew, like, this is sensitive subject matter. We had these dummies that uh, wonderful can be did this incredible articulated dummy to match our actress, Tiffany. So mm -hmm. when you first that first crime scene, you know, we've got a body and a dummy and it's pretty graphic, yeah. but it was really hard. Talk about, you know, utilizing our skills over the years and pooling together and working with different labs and, and makeup effects houses was great for, it was really nice to actually be able to work with that many people. And I'm curious, uh, what is your process to maintain the continuity of a makeup, you know, whether you're shooting over a few days or something like that? Boy, that's a great question because I find when you're working on a project with fewer days, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. If you have a project that shoots over, I don't know, six months or a year, differences that happen to people because we look different quite often, right? I mean, day to day, you can have a bad night's sleep. You can have a, a blemish. Uh, you know, something goes wrong. The hair doesn't quite match or, you know, there's something. Um there's a little leeway because you can introduce a, a change very subtly. Uh, if you have wounds, you know, bruises go away, cuts heal. Um, but when you have one or two days or nights, it has to be pretty consistent. And well, pretty, very consistent. And you got to really know how to retrace your steps when you're shooting out a sequence. So, you know, shooting you know, scene 14 on a Monday and shooting something else on Tuesday that's so far away and you're establishing maybe a wound on a stunt double before you put it on the actor. So you really have to think ahead and edit in your head how the director will feel about all these things. Um, I would say that I'm a stickler for continuity, but I'm not, I'm not myopic. I think that people get caught up in it if that makes sense, where, you know, you see people, it's quite a funny thing to me where you'll see makeup artists or hair or costume holding a picture and then try, and you think that that's never, if you're doing that and doing this, you're in trouble. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like studying, you know, five minutes before the exam. If you didn't figure it out, <laughs> right? what lake opens into this country and you're doing it on the day, you're not passing. That makes sense. Yeah. And how do you approach uh, realistic makeup versus something more fantastical? The sort of fantastical are kind of, well, they're not really in my wheelhouse. I, uh -huh. I'm not afraid to say to people, like if you called me, I remember being called years ago for the very first X-Men. Uh -huh. The very first one, it was shooting up in Toronto. Um, it, and there was nothing, I get it, I understand it. I, I know why people love them. It's not my vibe. It's uh -huh. not my cup of tea. Yeah. And I remember kind of going, ah, sorry guys, I'm not really that interested. There's other people who would, you know, who would love to do this film. And they did an amazing job. Uh, Ann Brody, Gord Smith, they created Mystique. And that wasn't my thing. And I'm really glad because if you're on the movie, a movie you don't love 
or you're not into it, it's kind of like school. If you love drama or Spanish or French, you will do well in it. If you hate math, you're not ever going to do well. Right. And I think that um, if I got a call, though, when Denis Villeneuve called me for Blade Runner, I was like, Denis, I don't know if this is my kind of movie. And he was like, yes, it is. You just don't think it is because he makes films that are based in reality. Absolutely. Yep. And, you know, it took a while because a lot of my peers and friends of mine, I really deeply admire their work, were like, Donald Mowat's doing Blade. That was their reaction. I could tell. And I thought, you know, but look at it from a different point of view, and it could be very different. Absolutely. But, you know, if you said, hey, you know, we're doing this movie and everybody's got horns and uh, elf <laughs> ears and funny, like, feet, like, uh, you know, The Hobbit, I would so not be working on that film. Yeah. Well, you have different characters who are different colors in Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, I think what yeah. you did, you, you brought to that a, a, a realism, especially with Gosling's uh, makeup. Uh, anytime he's kind of beat up, it, it reminded mm -hmm. me of some of your work in like The Fighter as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was it was great because I felt a lot of freedom. You know, Denis. Well, he's remarkable. Gives a lot of for Roger. I mean, they're really good friends of mine and we know each other. And I think that, you know, Roger just said, look, it's all a fan. Like, does it have to be this? Can it be that? Is it, it's a fantasy. I mean, so I think if you take that approach, um, you know, right now I'm working on ambulance for Michael Bay. I mean, who knew, um, <laughs> but I'm the same way. It's like, well, but, but, you know, why does it have to be like that? What, you know, um, so I, I felt like Blade Runner was kind of, we were, it worked really well because everybody was nervous making that film. There were so many expectations. And then with the little things you think, well, oh, here we're doing a movie with a nose and you know, it's predictable. But yet when I saw Jared, I realized we did the right thing. Absolutely. Yes. And I loved watching him in this film. Yeah, me too. He, his performance was fascinating. It was, it was almost like kind of jarring at first because it was so unusual, but I'm like, that's the right. whole point. He's playing games with these people. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there's something about him. It just, I don't know why I go back to this thing of, you know, when you're a kid and you learn, like you watch things like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And I think of a number of films where there's the bad guy or right. whoever you think is the bad guy. I like to play with the idea that sometimes like the most dangerous person Mm -hmm. is not the person who's all beefy, muscular. Right. Sometimes it's the quiet one, trim, fit. Yeah. Um, they make the best spies and the best KGB and the best CIA guys, right? They're not these big brutes because they're noticeable. Mm -hmm. But what I kept thinking with Jared at first, when I, I've seen guys that look like that in North Hollywood. You mm -hmm. see guys that walk around with sort of stringy yeah. hair and kind of a cross between, you know, uh, I don't know, Jethro Tull and like, you know, uh, there's just something about it that it's a bit Charles Manson, but it's a bit, it's real. It's a guy you've seen in, in, in LA. Well, I think that uh, John Lee Hancock is not getting enough credit for this movie in general. Uh, I think the way he subverted expectations, not only with the story, but with these characters is brilliant. So I agree. He's a wonderful writer. And he's also, you know, can I just say that People forget, sometimes we don't say enough about how he's a very nice person. That's got to count for something. Absolutely. He's a, a delightful man. He's charming. He, um, his, he gets a bit anxious and unsure when you ask him something about a dead body. You think, why would he know? He's made four or five movies. Right. He's a lovely writer. He's a very nice man and deeply respectful for what we all do. And I, I it was kind of a breath of fresh air for me. Um, to be around that where a guy says, look, what do you think? And, and because everybody's an expert now, and especially in my area, I find there's a lot of people will decide um, what the makeup will be. Well, and I've got just one more question for you. Sure. Um, I'm curious to know what more would you like to do in your career? Is there anything that you want to tackle that you haven't yet? Well, that's a great question. Um, so I'm really interested in First World War. I mean, Okay. Part of I love 1917, and I love what they did, and Roger and all my friends on it. Um, it's a period I really like. Uh, I, I've always been fascinated by it because there were so many 
social changes that came. So whether it's in America or in North America or Europe, it's a period I'm interested in. There's also a kind of, um, not so much sci-fi, but there are, I never realized how much sci-fi really was more appealing to me, like oh, the God. Margaret Atwood things and, you know, Blade Runner, things like that. So pardon me, I think I, I've excluded myself from sci-fi. And then I was looking at things like the black hole and kind of when that's really interesting makeup also based in reality. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, I'm kind of looking at things I normally wouldn't have. Uh, uh, when I started, I wanted to work on Merchant Ivory movies doing, you know, things with like, you know, Howard's End or film, which now I kind of don't know if I would love working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I love working with directors who really challenge you. It's what well, it gives you that, that pit in your stomach or when you feel, you know, your heart in your throat. I think that's good for me. I mean, it's not good for my blood pressure, um, <laughs> but I feel it's what makes me tick a little bit. And that sort of sense of anxiety and neuroses makes me do better work. And I think the actors are like that and um, working with costume, makeup, hair, effects. And I, I kind of like that slightly heightened, you know, let's do, we got to do it now. We got to try it. And I kind of, I thrive on that. That's that's wonderful. And you've had such an amazing career. And I look forward to seeing uh, more from you in the future. Uh, it's been an Thank absolute you. pleasure to speak with you, Donald. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. You're welcome. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it and taking, yeah, absolutely. taking the time to do this with me.